We're on. Uh, hey, everybody. We're uh, here today to talk about OpenStack in production. So specifically, we have a panel. Panel format, super simple to manage because everybody gets to ask questions at any time. So you could ask a question now. Anybody? No, no questions? OK, I'm just warming you up. Um, so this is the panel of five OpenStack experts, uh, all part of HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And uh, we talk about running OpenStack at scale in real life productions. When, when, we, when we started to think about this topic, we were brainstorming, um, actually with Gavin, who is up here up front, who is our panelist 5B or 6, uh, if needed, uh, to talk about like what are the big core topics in running OpenStack at scale. So of course, as you define it, scale is one of such topics, and we have an expert who'll talk about that. Uh, compliance, security, uh, absolutely important topics for us to, to take into consideration. So uh, what does it take to run OpenStack uh, with DR, disaster recovery, business continuity in mind? Yet another topic that we'll discuss today. And finally, networking and monitoring as well. So, I will introduce, uh, well, actually, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves and give them one minute to just talk about, um, just in summary, what their area of expertise is. Uh, at this point, just let our panel talk, but keep track of the questions you want to ask. And what we'll do then is we'll kick off with a couple of questions to the panel. We'll try to make it in a really interactive uh, type of format. So let me ask a question to the audience first, because you're our yet another kind of panel, esteemed colleagues and partners and customers. Who here runs OpenStack in production? Raise your hands. Just a few, OK. Who here is interested in running OpenStack in production? OK, so a few more. What is everybody else doing here, then? <laughs> just, just clarifying. Installing and fixing, excellent. Um, so just curious. Uh, just so our audience and our panelists know what type of folks are here. Who here is uh, a CXO, um, what they consider themselves an exec or manager, uh, somebody that uh, gives directions but doesn't really um, uh, necessarily roll up and code or do plugging cables in? Anybody here? No? That's kind of putting everyone in spot? Excellent. Uh, thank you, sir. That's very brave of you in the middle. Uh, appreciate that. Okay, uh, now who is an architect and actually thinks about deploying uh, different cloud clusters? Thank you very much. There's one architect, two, three, four, more architects, five. You, you can also raise hands at the same time. It doesn't have to be done. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it actually goes faster that way. Um, how about developers that contribute to OpenStack projects? Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's awesome. See, they're, they're raising hands at the same time. They actually know how to, how to build things concurrently and collaborate. That's really important. Yeah, thanks, Brad. OK, how about developers that do not contribute to OpenStack but are developer um, build applications, ISVs, uh, cloud service providers, system integrators, and so, so on? OK, awesome. Now, Category that I may have forgotten or don't know how to categorize, maybe IT professional or somebody is, is maybe just learning or just interested in just hanging out and listening to what HP has to say. Okay, we got one, thank you. Um, anybody else want to volunteer? Press? Nope, anybody here to? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic, all right, well. So uh, thank you for that. That actually gives us a nice understanding of a mix of folks in the, in the audience. So we're going to start off. So uh, again, one minute. Brad, you're going to kick it off. Just tell us, uh, tell us what do you do and why you're here. Hi, I'm Brad Saunders. I'm Director of Engineering in uh, Helion OS. I manage the metering, monitoring, logging, backup recovery teams. Uh, I've been with OpenStack for over four years, started in Diablo. Uh, ran OpenStack at scale uh, in our HP's public cloud. We had about 4,000 servers in that cloud running in uh, two different regions and uh, started uh, building monitoring tools um, from scratch at that time frame and uh, come a long way since then. So monitoring is uh, one thing that's pr pretty important to me and, and uh, being able to have the data necessary to run the cloud. Thanks, Brad. All right, Fabrizio, you're up next. I'm Fabrizio Fresco. I'm uh, Helium Professional Services team. 
I'm, let's say, solution architect. We supposed to support our customer in deploying and customizing OpenStack. Um, I am a core reviewer of the Freezer project that has backup as a service. We started that a couple of years ago in in HP, uh, looking at the, the requirements from our public cloud and with it's kind of a successful project. Great. Okay, great, thank you, Joy. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. So my name is Joy Durairaj. I'm a senior product manager for security at uh, Helen OpenStack. And I've been with um, HP Enterprise for a little over almost three years now. And the last year and a half has been with um, OpenStack. Been in the security industry for many, many years. So um, why am I here, right? So people talk a lot about you know deploying OpenStack and um, uh, taking it to production, and you talk about um, you know in the installation pains and so on. But what is the biggest barrier to adoption, right? Security and security and compliance. So though survey after survey, you take any survey that you take, whether it's you know the survey that we run at HP or whether it's you know. Um, the um, CIO survey that's done every year. So security is still a biggest barrier to adoption. So as customers begin to make the journey towards uh, um, you know, deploying OpenStack clouds, uh, the biggest question remains is, hey, how do I remain compliant? And you know, what are the security controls should I be thinking about? So these are the questions that actually um, I think a lot about, and I talk to a, a lot of my customers. I talk to a lot of my field sales, like um, people like in and I interact with my engineering team and so on. So I'm here to kind of share my views on you know what I've been finding so far. Thank you, Joy. Swami. Hey, my name is Swami Nathan Vasudevan, and I'm working for HP Cloud Networking, and I'm an active contributor for Neutron since 2013, and uh, I have delivered uh, some of the key uh, features in Neutron, such as VPN as a service as well as uh, DVR. So I'm here to discuss about the networking. Uh, solutions and how we can actually scale networking in production with OpenStack. So if you have any questions, please let me know and I'll pass it on to Paul. Okay, hi, I'm, my name is Paul Murray. I'm the technical lead for Nova within HP and I'm a regular contributor to the Nova project. Um, as Brad said at the beginning, we used to run the HP Public Cloud. Um, that was a pretty large system, and I'm one of the people that had to get up in the middle of the night if there was something broken and log on to the machines and fix stuff and things like that. So we've got some experience of things that go wrong with scaled systems. Um, you might find that other companies have larger scale systems, say 10,000 nodes. Um, ours is only a couple of thousand, but one thing that was different about ours was we used to run it as a single large system rather than splitting up into cells or anything like that. So we were actually, at least a couple of years ago, one of the biggest single systems out there. Um, the other end of the scale, I run things on DevStack on my desktop. We're now producing the Helion releases and that's going out to other people that are going to deploy it in all sorts of different ways. And so we're interested in the different dimensions things are going to have to scale out in. It could be geographically distributed with lots of small nodes. It could be all in one big data center. Um, it could be different aspects of the system that need to scale, like how fast you start and stop VMs versus how many compute nodes there are. All these dimensions come up with different kinds of problems, and I'm just interested in looking around at those. Awesome. All right, Paul. So does anybody have any burning questions right now that you must get off your chest and ask right now? Feel free to raise your hand. Don't be shy. Members of the press? No? Uh, not yet? Oh, OK, good, good. Well, I do have a burning question. And since uh, Paul, uh, Joy has the mic, I was going to say, since Paul had the mic previously, and scale is in the title and description for the, uh, not in the title, but in the abstract of the session. So let's talk about scale for a second. Is this an absolute concept? So is it like you must scale, you know how to scale? Or is it dependent on workloads? Does it depend on other factors? And how does how do all of the different uh, projects that we just discussed here, from Neutron to uh, to Freezer, for example, factor into that? Put you right on the spot. Okay. Um, well, one thing that's difficult about scale is what do people mean when they say scale? Because anyone who comes up and talks about it for themselves will give you something different. So scale may be 
how wide a path the system is. So if you've got 10 nodes at 50 different sites, can you manage that as a single system? That's something they may need to do. Um, alternatively, they may have to you know, run a really small system. So I'm saying things about small because people always think big. Right? Things have to scale down to. Um, I think that the speed of uh, deployment of VMs is another one. If people often want to say create a thousand or five thousand VMs as fast as they possibly can. That's a completely different problem to having a thousand compute nodes. And you get different parts of the system become bottlenecks and weeding out those bottlenecks is what it's all about for us. Makes sense. So um Footprint is an interesting topic. Does anybody here want to share their experience or questions specific to Footprint? Specifically, what I'm interested in is, do you run uh, two sites with 1,000 nodes or 200 nodes in each site? Do you run 50 sites with 10 nodes in each one? Different scenarios, different types of problems. Anybody want to share? Anybody has specific use cases? Because if not, we're going to go back to talking about public cloud that we used to have. And Brad can share kind of how we did that as one system as well. Come on, don't be shy. There's a question. I'm interested in hearing more about uh, deploying to multiple zones. Oh, okay. Interested in understanding more about deploying to multiple zones, uh, multiple geographies, maybe even having different profiles in those geographies to deal with data regulations and in country regulations. All right, so it sounds like a possibly compliance data regulations type of topic, and also deploying different zones. Who wants to take it? So I'll take the deployment part, and uh, Joy can talk about compliance. So it's pretty important, actually, that you have configurability in the way you deploy your cloud. And uh, we've been working at HP or uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise around configurability of uh, deployments. And I'm sure there's some talks you can pick up to, to see that. But it's, it's very important that uh, your, your cloud be defined in the region how it's going to be deployed. Uh, with flexibility, and then with that flexibility, you can uh, you can actually use the tools in OpenStack very easily to uh, deploy out the cloud in different configurations. Um, specifically around monitoring, which is my my key piece, we have automated tooling that when you deploy your cloud, depending upon the region, it'll actually automatically configure the uh, metrics and meters that you need and uh, send them to the right place, and so. It's, it's, it's important to deal with those kinds of situations with the appropriate tooling uh, for both deployment and uh, to set up your metering and monitoring such that it uh, picks up the different configurations and, and mirrors them appropriately. And uh, Joy can talk about compliance. So, um, so when you look at compliance in a, um, you know, in a multi um, zone kind of deployment, so first of all, when you think about security, there are two things that uh, come to mind. So one is, how do you, um, you know, mitigate your risk? It's uh, but the big, big thing about security is risk mitigation. And um, the second aspect of security is uh, how to remain compliant. Obviously, you know, when customers move from different types of, um, from their, uh, from their um, say, virtualized or traditional IT environment into, say, an open stack cloud, uh, they still have to become compliant. Um, so, so when you really look at it from a risk mitigation standpoint, you have to be looking at, you have to put yourself in the shoes of an attacker. You have to look at different attack scenarios and then say, uh, across my entire stack, you know, what are the possibilities and where are the back doors and how can an attack, what are the risk vectors associated with it? So when you, when you really look at that, and the, the uh, couple of things come to mind, uh, best practices in terms of you know, um, hardening your stack end to end. I think ultimately um, you'll have to look at you know, how, are you, um, how are you hardening your, um, your distribution? How are you hardening at every layer? So how are you hardening at the hardware, um, at the hardware layer, maybe doing like you know, a hardware root of trust, as, um, attestation based on um, you know, hardware root of trust. When you get to the hypervisor, how do you reduce the attack of uh, um, um, you know how do you how do you reduce the attack surface how do you ensure hypervisor integrity so doing things like you know app armor sc linux for your compute nodes those are all really important from a security standpoint and then when you go up to say your um, your openstack services layer then you have to think about
about you know how are you how are your users accessing it so you got to have a good rollback um, a rollback uh, or back or rather role role based access control strategy in place so you need to understand you know who are your users that are going to be accessing it uh, what are their roles going to be how are your projects and tenants going to be uh, doled out between you know different zones um, then the the other aspect to it is you know how are your data protection so you have to think about you know what kind of data you're storing you know how are you encrypting that data where are the keys stored now the key thing to remember for from a data protection standpoint is you got to be able to separate the keys from the data never put them both together so you have to look at you know how do, how do you how do you uh, configure your uh, openstack cloud to uh, barbican is a great example so you can configure barbican to say hey go store my keys in an external device so you got to think about that and then your your um, uh, your uh, transmission so you got to encrypt your channels you got to encrypt your data in transit in uh, in in transit and then um, you also have to have a solid audit trail because you want to keep track of all your system level activity you want to keep track of you know your um, your uh, any type of privilege escalations. So, in, in a nutshell, I would say that you really have to think about security uh, from a defense in-depth uh, perspective. You have to think about it from a attack, different attack scenarios. How do you reduce the attack surface, and where are all the th possible threats, and how do you uh, you know mitigate those controls? Yeah, uh, with respect to networking, I would recommend that um, you clearly segregate um, the L2 and L3 stuff. So basically, between the zones, don't interoperate between the zones. And if you want to have uh, some kind of uh, high availability or redundancy, or if you want to create uh, some kind of load balancing services, just have it within the zones um, so that you provide enough uh, capabilities within the zones available. And if, if one zone goes away, then the other go zone can uh, come into play, but within a zone, you just provide that kind of uh, high availability and isolation so that you clearly can articulate um, that you have high availability and networking for the services that you are providing. All right, well, any other questions, a follow on question? Somebody looks like they're raising their hand, but I'm not sure if that, okay. So, uh, oh, yeah, please go ahead. You Wow. Thank you. All site security is one of maybe the number one roadblock to adoption. Uh, but I've seen some uh, some surveys that go into some some depth here, where fo folks have been asked, especially developers, been asked, you know, how long does it take? Uh, a project go through the consideration phase within your organization. I say about a year. Uh, how how long does a deliberation take once it's reached the executive desk? About another year. Uh, when, once the project's been decided upon, how long does it take the, the the initiation to get started so that people start working on it? Another year. Then what's the number one barrier to adoption? Oh, it's security. Uh, in the in the the keynotes yesterday, we saw. Uh, the need to change the corporate culture sometimes. I'm wondering whether you've considered that perhaps when people answer security to that question, it's because they're a little embarrassed to say what the real answer is, and the real answer is, well, procrastination. Actually, that's a, that's a very good point. So one of the things that uh, we've been seeing, even with Hewlett Packard Enterprises, as uh, our customers are moving to OpenStack, developers are actually you know the the you know, the kings of the new world, right? They have the keys to the kingdom because a lot of these are completely REST API driven, and um, and and a lot and a lot of uh, enterprises are still uh, understanding that new paradigm, understanding the API paradigm. They're trying to understand you know all. all how does it take from a security standpoint for you know securing your code? Uh, previously, they were all in you know, a proprietary software. Like who really you know worried about um, you know? Uh, I mean, obviously patching is important, but there wasn't enough attention paid to um, you know doing vulnerability scan of your of your release every uh, every release, doing threat analysis every release. But I think what has happened in recent times is with the, with the um, with OpenStack um, becoming more in a prime time, coming of age, um, I think people have started to realize that um, um, you know secure code development practices are very.
very key. They're very critical to um, from a secure from a security standpoint, especially when you look at open source software. So from that perspective, I think you know the uh, training or uh, the awareness and training is very is very essential. And I think you hit upon a right, and uh, you hit the right, um, um, you hit the nail right there. And one of the things that we are doing in uh, at uh, HPE is we are actually conducting a lot of uh, developer security awareness trainings. Uh, our secure, we have a security team, a uh, dedicated you know team of experts with many years of uh, experience running in a public cloud and coming from top-notch you know companies like AWS and Microsoft and so on. So these guys, they literally go, they go out to our development teams. They actually go walk these developers through secure coding practices so that you know developers in don't do things like um, you know bad security practices like capturing you know passwords and clear text and putting them in config files or you know doing you know leaving like um, the, um, you know buffer overflows or you know some sort of uh, in go SQL injection attacks and things like that so I think that more and more awareness is very critical for um, for breaking that uh, barrier to adoption. And in fact, Gartner also did a recent sort of, um, you know talk on security. They said very clearly, you cannot you cannot be more secure. You know your data cannot be more secure in a public cloud. They said the the, the kind of controls that public cloud providers provide provide today is actually phenomenal. And they've said that you know you really have to change your uh, uh, con perception from that perspective. I don't know if I've touched, but I think the key thing here is that training and awareness is critical, and you have to understand that OpenStack is new paradigm. But realistically, also, um, barrier to adoption means that you need to define what are you running, uh, how are you running OpenStack? Is it at mm -hmm. production scale? Are we running at dev test scale? So talking about production, just switching gears a little bit, what are the approaches uh, to ensure that your production environment doesn't go down? So we're talking about DR a little bit. I'm going to go put Fabrizio on, on, on the spot a little bit. So um, I know at least I we were in the textile building across the street where HP has uh, a kind of um, offsite lounge. And I have some customers stopping by. And at least two or three customers brought up this theme, which is, OK, so how are you guys approaching your backup DR um, uh, solutions with Helium OpenStack? And what are the ways that you architect it? How do you ensure, like, and you're in the field and working with a lot of our customers, like what are the different requirements for the architectures and how, do, how does Frieza, specifically your project, help with that? So in, <coughs> in, in Hino OpenStack, it's Frieza came out of the box for backing up the infrastructure. So there are uh, a few critical points inside of our, our OpenStack deployment. That's the MySQL database, for example. That's uh, a critical thing. It could happen that some mistakes happen. I mean, it's redundant because it's a cluster. Mm, you can lose one node, then nothing will happen. But let's say a human mistake, you mm, delete one table, and your, your cloud is not working anymore. So we are taking care of that out of the box. Um, we implement an even new functionalities. The default backend for Freezer was to backup in the object storage. But that's not good for the disaster point of view, because if you lose your keystone, you will not be able to access the object storage anymore, and you cannot restore your data. So. We added new backends that are mainly useful only in these use cases, like uh, NFS server shared attached to a SAN, or an SSH node attached to a, to a SAN when you store your critical data. Um, that's how we, we mean to, let's say, protect our infrastructure. Yep. Then Freezer obviously is it's a backup as a service, so uh, you can deploy your agents inside of virtual, mach virtual machines, so the users of the cloud can do the same that we do for the cloud. So, so you're talking about de deploying agents. Uh, there's also some, I guess, agentless approaches and 
kind of uh, building what you talk about, which is running different control planes, our Helen OpenStack minimum is across three nodes, right? Um, so uh, at the same time, when we're running public cloud, so I'm gonna kind of ask Brad, what are your findings about running really large scale production? So thousands of nodes um, and specifically tooling and how we are evolving our monitoring approach and lessons learned from being able to see what's happening with the uh, underlying um, cloud fabric to actual hypervisors to actual VMs. So talk to us a little bit about the, the holistic approach. Sure, so um, as I mentioned, I've been with OpenStack for four years and started uh, doing monitoring. At that point, uh, we actually build internal systems uh, to do large scale monitoring. And uh, as a result of the architecture we created for both large scale monitoring for our under cloud and our uh, control plane workloads and also uh, monitoring as a service we created, we combined that into a single technology that's now in the OpenStack Big Tent called Monoska. Monoska stands for monitoring at scale. It's designed actually to have uh, the capability of providing up to 100,000 alarms a second and our 100,000 metrics a second into the alarming database. Uh, so it's, it's uh, well, well positioned to scale to uh, clouds that have, of, of very large sizes. Uh, the key thing though about Monoska and the monitoring at scale is the ability to be able to not only watch the control plane and under cloud situations, but also be able to watch the VMs internal to, uh, to that system. It also combines um, uh, performance monitoring as well. So w one of the things we learned as we were running monitoring at scale, there's many different pieces of data that, that collaborate together to provide the picture of what's going on in your system. Performance monitoring is a piece of that. Event monitoring is a piece of that. Logs are a piece of that. Metrics themselves, a piece of that as well. And so we designed a tool that can combine all those pieces together into a single uh, into a single place. That gives you, first off, single pane of glass for all those me metrics and, and meters. Uh, the ability to do alarming, both simple and compound alarming, uh, which is critical because you, as you create compound alarms, it allows you to do uh, complex triaging uh, with alarms rather than have to do that triaging when you see multiple alarms coming at you at the same time. So you can actually look at you know what scenarios might happen in my cloud and how can I predict those scenarios and create alarms and compound alarms that tell me when that scenario occurs and be able to react, react to that scenario rather than react to many alarms. Uh, so that's a key learning we had as we were running our, our cloud at scale. Uh, the other thing I mentioned earlier is the importance of automating. Uh, when, you, when you configure your cloud, you add, you grow the cloud, you shrink the cloud, you change the configuration in any way, you want to automate the ability to set the alarms appropriately uh, so that people aren't configuring your cloud or adding nodes that aren't alarmed or aren't monitored in some way. Uh, so that's also a key piece of, of learning that we, uh, we, we came, uh, came to as we were running it. And uh, uh, the other key thing, which is simple, but uh, a lot of people forget, is every alarm should have an action. So we shouldn't be putting alarms in the system that have no actions, uh, because our operators will see those and not know what to do. And it's very easy to do that, and, and it's very easy as you tar start to build and scale out to get a lot of alarms in the system and, and really not have actions associated with them, and people get overwhelmed when they see many alarms going off. So uh, it's critical, even though it's simple, it's critical to have actions associated with every alarm. Uh, that's a good reason also to have compound alarming because you can reduce the number of actions you actually have to have. So, Awesome. So just a time check. We only have about nine minutes left. So this is a great opportunity to ask questions. And thank you. There's a question here. Um, I have a question for uh, Fabrizio on the Freezer project um, on the backup and DR. Is there any specific reason why you chose to make Freezer a separate project under the Big Tent rather than go the route of extending Cinder, which would have been a natural fit, I would think? So um, the backup part in Cinder, it's, it's kind of a perfect example of a bottleneck uh, that came out from our experience in, in the public cloud again, because you know, uh, with Cinder you can only back up an entire volume that can be two terabyte when your critical data could be only a few megabyte. And we had a lot of performance problem inside of the public cloud because usually the backups start all at the same time, triggered during the night, 
and you have a lot of data that's going to be uh, treated inside of your control plane because it's, it's inside of Cinder backup component that run in the control plane that is doing all the compression and all the work to create the backup. Uh, exactly for this reason in Freezer, one of the main goal that we, we, we put ourselves was to be able to scale. For this reason, all the, this kind of elaboration is going to be done on, on the agent that run on the node, uh, physical or virtual, where you are taking the backups. That it's, if you scale out, it's thousands of nodes, it's not a few, a bunch of nodes that is what it's your control plane. Thank you. Any others at this point? Time is ticking. Only five more minutes or six more minutes. If not, I'm going to actually. Yeah. So, uh, Gavin. Panelist number six. Panelist number six. Um, so, one of the other important things to think about OpenStack in general is that when you go to cloud, um, you almost think of the control plane as a traditional app, in that if the control plane goes down, you're completely hosed. In the traditional app world, you know, 10 years ago, the control plane mattered less. It was all about, you know, I have a number of machines that <coughs> are very reliable. I might use things like vMotion to make sure that those things never go down. Um, that's not the case in the cloud. And so one of the important goals that we had with Freezer, uh, and in general with our, you know, holistic backup DR approach in Helium OpenStack, but again, we open sourced it, so it's part of the community, is you have to make sure that control plane is protected. So it could be things like passwords. So if I don't, you know, you don't want to lose access to your cloud. Um, you know, I mean, God forbid, you know, what, what the whole, whole control plane goes down, you're, you're toast. And so we felt it was important to architect something that well, in many ways was above and separate from something like Cinder, because in many ways Cinder kind of runs in the cloud. And it's, of course, part of the control plane. But we needed something that, um, you know, could be so somewhat um, independent. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks for joining us. All right, so um, I actually did want to pick up on something which uh, I think Paul was starting to talk about, and, and I heard some themes, which is, and this is just my layman's question for you, is scale and is running OpenStack at production, is it workload specific? Like, can you tell us about that, and also maybe Swami also talk about that from a networking standpoint? Um, it is, and I'll give you a good example of that. We so didn't practice this ahead <laughs> of time, no. <laughs> um, so CI systems are a good example. Um, we had a whole bunch of equipment that had been set up as a cloud before and had been running proper workloads that then got decommissioned and we were going to take it over as our CI workload. Um, and it was using a storage area network. And it was working perfectly well as a cloud, but when we put it up as a CI system, we found that you get an awful lot of data being transferred around and the VM's not doing an awful lot afterwards. They're running a few tests and then stopping. You spawn something up, copy images all over the place, run some tests, collect all the reports and the logs and everything that were done as part of that test and ship them off somewhere else in so that you can look at it later if there was a failure in the test. The consequence of that was that the storage area network wasn't spec'd for that quantity of data being shifted around and it got saturated and the result of that is um, everything seems to be working fine, but within the VMs, they start to behave as if their disks are full. Or they're getting read errors and write errors and all sorts of things start to fall apart. So the point of that is um, how you spec out your equipment to match the amount of I.O. that's going on, the amount of memory, the amount of disk that's going to be required, network bandwidth, is all very critical. And you can get things skewed the wrong way and your system's out of balance, and then you're going to hit something that's not going to work. You build a VM that's nice and big, but it can't talk down the network because everyone else is trying to do the same thing. And as a result, you've then invested in a whole lot of memory that's not being used. So understand your workload, um, give appropriate quotas and things in your system, make sure that requests aren't coming into it too fast, and get the balance right so you're not spending money on resources that don't get used. Thanks, Paul. So one last thought from each of the panelists, starting with Swami. Yeah, uh, so the one, one other thing I wanted to add on to what Paul mentioned, um, 
yeah, for networking perspective, we should also consider like how many networks that you are going to define and how many routers, uh, if at all, if you're having L3 networks uh, within your cloud, um, how many routers that you're going to try to provision within a node, which is going to service um, number of VMs that within a node. So you, um, p you place it in such a way that you evenly distribute the VMs based upon the resources in the compute node so that you can bring up the VMs and then it would be uh, serviced by the routers and networks. And if you want to scale um, uh, at a higher level, like probably like 8,000 VMs or uh, 5,000 VMs uh, in, at a stretch. So um, there are different options to go through, but um, if you can actually go through the uh, distributed virtual routers um, in order to uh, accommodate the control plane uh, issues, we, we are creating, um, the, the routers are created on demand. It's not going to be created all the nodes at the same, same time. So whenever a VM pops up, that's when the routers will be created and um, on, on those compute nodes and then the, your traffic will be routed. And also make sure that you are uh, provisioning the nodes uh, with right network connectivity, either if you want uh, not south connect, um, not south uh, connectivity to the external network, you provision that with uh, uh, not south connectivity so that uh, you can actually assign uh, floating IPs to your VMs and pass traffic uh, from the compute nodes rather than forwarding it everything everything to the network node with SNAT. So unless and otherwise you don't need an SNAT, um, you can just use the floating IPs and, and VMs and, and configure the network. And also, like if you want uh, high availability, make sure that you are uh, configuring high availability in such a way that um, if you are just using the regular routers, just go for the L3 HA, and if you are using uh, DVRs and uh, if you are using uh, a single node SNAT, just you can still use the DVR SNAT uh, HA that is available in Mitaka, and probably uh, also with the uh, the router scaling, um, as I mentioned, um, with the DVRs, um, the performance within a compute node uh, will be higher enough. So if you are deploying a, a high, highly uh, available solution and with a higher throughput, just make sure you, you can actually place all your VMs uh, that are uh, that requires higher performance within a single um, node so that um, you can actually achieve a higher performance to that. Great. So any last thoughts from anybody else or last questions? All right, so we actually thought, uh, I thought this was really useful, at least to me. Um, what I learned from here is that now we're from, not, from networking to scale, monitoring, uh, DR, BCDR, and security, of course, all those are big considerations. And you can't really take one topic single-handedly and say that's the most important one. And they're kind of all interwe interwoven and all interconnected as the experience here has shown. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, up next, I believe we have a really cool format, which is an Ignite session, uh, where in five minutes, uh, a different speaker, each there's four speakers, will be delivering a topic really fast, rapid pace. But for now, I just want to thank our panelists uh, for taking their time, and thank you for coming over. Let's give them a round of applause.